Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Erin Will Morton. I direct the Global Health Technologies Coalition, and we're pleased to partner today with the Geneva Center for Security Policy on this exciting event. Uh, GHTC is a coalition of about 25 members, nonprofit members, working to promote policies that boost the development of new drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, and other health tools. Our members are product development partnerships, academic organizations, think tanks and implementers. We're based in Washington, D.C., where we do most of our advocacy work around the U.S. government. We also do some work in the multilateral space, convening dialogues like this one, with the goal of uh, pr providing different perspectives on issues and having frank discussions about topics related to global health R&D. And that's just what we're hoping we have today. We're looking forward to a really robust discussion, and I'd like to thank our moderator, Joelle, for leading our panel today. So I will turn it over to you, Joelle. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm uh, Joël Tanguy. I'm executive in residence at the Geneva Security Center for Security Policy, and I'm happy to welcome you. I'm also, for the sake of full disclosure, a proud uh, member of the board of the Access to Medicine Index Foundation, as well as um, Drug for Neglected Disease Initiative. So in this context, I, um, I uh, get the opportunity to welcome you on behalf of the Geneva Center for Security Policy, which you will see is actually a unique location, unique setting for multi-stakeholder, relatively inno innovative executive training, as well as a policy analysis uh, in peace and security, and nowadays security being understood as human security, and therefore the health security agenda being very much at the heart of our conversation today. I would like to um, extend a warm welcome to our panelists. We have a, a cadre of uh, amazing world experts in the subject matter, so we're very grateful for them to have extracted themselves from the World Health Assembly taking place across town. And I want to also extend a warm welcome to all of you in the room in Geneva, as well as to our participants online who we no, do not see, but from whom we'll be fielding questions as well. Um, a few rules. The first one is, this is Chatham House rules. That means you can quote what you hear, but you cannot attribute it. And that will allow our participants and our panelists to actually be much more forthcoming with their contributions. The second rule is that we will adjourn at 2 p.m. This gives us a very short time frame to actually proceed with this session. And therefore, we look forward to your contributions being short and to the point, and uh, particularly in the form of questions. Now, on the substance. Across town, as I said, opens the 69th World Assembly, um, which is uh, the highest governing body of the World Health Organization. And there's great momentum in global health, really very uh, significant momentum, and uh, for good and for bad reasons, which we'll discuss actually today. Uh, behind Ebola, Zika, behind uh, the rise of antimicrobial resistance and the challenges of the SDGs, we really are looking at a thorny issue today, which is the question of research and development. In other words, how do we prepare to build the armamentarium of drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics that we need now and that we will need tomorrow uh, for global health? And um, this is the, the core question for the panelists is actually how, do we actually, how are we faring on global R&D? What's the cross-cutting R&D message of the World Health Assembly today and what are we looking at in terms of structuring an accelerated push for R&D for neglected diseases and R&D for diseases of the future um, in, the, in uh, the World Health Assembly context. Um, I, um, I think our panelists will help analyze these issues. Uh, uh, particularly, um, let me briefly introduce them while referring to the longer bios which are available either on your chairs or online for those of you who um, uh, are, are online. Um, I will turn first to His Excellency Ambassador Guilherme Patriota, who is the um, Ambassador Permanent Representative of Brazil to the United Nations in Geneva. Sorry, Deputy. And, um, but he's a great champion of um, R&D for global health and uh, we look forward to hearing from him. To my right is Marie-Paul Kierney, Assistant Director General at WHO, leading the Health System and Innovation Cluster, and uh, will bring a wealth of expertise and great insights from the World Health Organization to us today. 
Uh, from Harvard University, on my left, is Suri Moon, uh, um, the research director and co-chair of the Forum on Global Governance for Health at the Harvard uh, Global Health Institute. Um, she has contributed more recently to a number of uh, publications, reviews, and panels, and we look forward to hearing from her that perspective. And uh, last but not least, two critical participants to uh, research and development. David Caslow and Bernard Picoul. David comes to us from Seattle, and he represents PATH and oversees the product development programs for PATH, including the Malaria Vaccine Initiative, I understand, as well as the, vaccine, uh, the uh, PATH Center for Vaccine Innovation and Access. And um, interestingly, he brings to us also expertise in the private sector for 25 years, so looking forward to his input. And last but not least, Bernard Pecoul, who is the director of the Drug for Neglected Disease Initiative. Bernard, as you um, know, is actually through the DNDI initiative, has actually brought together public and private stakeholders and research institutions to develop new drugs for the most neglected diseases. I believe the DNDI has delivered six um, new treatments for the most neglected diseases and has now a large portfolio, solid portfolio for uh, further product development. So in this context, um, one can already see that we're looking at the policy picture, but we're also looking at the practical ways that in the last couple of years, um, the innovative structures such as product development partnerships. Uh, we are members of the Global Health Technology, Co the Global Technology Coalition, has actually been able to uh, move the agenda. Probably those PDPs have been the single most factor of progress on the global R&D agenda in the last decade. Question, what's the next decade looking like? This will be the subject for our conversation today. So let me first turn to Marie-Paul, if I may, and ask you, Marie-Paul, um, so we, we said the World Health Assembly is opening across town. You will actually have to leave us at 2 p.m. So we, that is the hard deadline. So you can be in your seat when the, the Director General speaks. Um, can you tell us a bit what are the current issues at the World Health Assembly and try to kind of put that in perspective of the R&D agenda we want to focus across? Thank you very much. So, of course, the, the World Health Assembly is, is looking at many other, many uh, agenda that do not have R&D at their core. But, but also, as soon as, uh, as you talk about medicines, and many agenda items are talking about medicine, then immediately the issue of R&D com comes forward. Now, in terms of formal uh, agenda items, we have one, uh, the, the first one to be treated will be uh, related to Ebola. And it will relate to a request that the Ebola special session, the uh, executive board spe special session on Ebola, which was held last year in January, requested the director general to present option for sharing information on uh, medical technologies for diseases which are um, prone to epidemics, um, sharing options on information gathering and disseminating as well as uh, options for having, uh, moving ahead in R&D preparedness. So this is not uh, strict to sense to what is written in the, in the request law. So we have been working on two, um, two important initiatives. One is the R&D Observatory, which is also part of a so-called CEWG uh, strategic agenda, which I'm sure we'll, we'll mention again. And, uh, and the other, which is more recent, is the R&D R&D blueprint for, um, for action uh, for R&D preparedness for uh, diseases which are likely or could uh, be at the origin of, um, of an epidemic. So this is the first agenda item. It's likely to be on Wednesday. Then on Friday, we will have a report of the meeting that we had beginning of May on the follow-up of the uh, of, uh, report of the CEWG, again, the Consultative Expert Working Group on, the, um, on Research and Development Financing and Coordination. So this uh, uh, open-ended meeting of, of member states is bringing forward for discussion at the World Health Assembly uh, a draft resolution, um, which, is, uh, which is full of brackets. I don't know if you know what, is, what are brackets. 
but everything which is not agreed is, is between brackets. So uh, there are many paragraphs in this resolution. There are only two which are not bracketed, and they say nothing. So um, this will be certainly an interesting discussion. In principle, it comes up on Friday, but it will, uh, there will be a need for a lot of discussion before it can be fully discussed uh, among in, in official sessions. So uh, in the report, uh, we will have also uh, a report on the WHO strategy on research for health, which is likely to come up on Saturday. There are too many. In this World Health Assembly, we have a record number of items, so and a record number of pages, and a record number of, of uh, resolution which are bracketed. So, so uh, my, uh, my assessment is that the reports will come very, very late in the agenda, and, and most likely uh, not before Saturday afternoon. I hope not evening. So another important also agenda item in terms of research is the discussion on uh, antimicrobial resistance, uh, where research, as you know, is an important part of pushing the agenda forward and part of a global action plan uh, on, anti on combating antimicrobial resistance. So this will be quite uh, interesting also. And finally, other two, two uh, agenda items where R&D and related aspects may come up, uh, to an, an agenda item on medicine shortages and another one on medicines for children. So an interesting uh, week ahead. So is the, is the role of WHO in the future on global health R&D in brackets as well? Or do you have a sense of where that is headed? Well, that's very interesting. And actually, I looked at, uh, uh, to prepare for this, uh, this side event, I, I look at what is the, the role of WHO in research and how is it featured. So uh, research is, is one of the constitutional responsibility of WHO. And I have just printed here to be sure about the terms, um, the core functions of WHO, which was decided, uh, uh, finalized. There are several iterations, but the latest one that we have, and one of the core functions is on research. So it says that uh, the core function is to sh shaping the research agenda and stimulating the generation, translation, and dissemination of valuable knowledge. So you can see there's anything ex except for funding, which is a good idea. So, but if we have a another core function, which touches very much about research, which is about providing leaderships leadership on matters critical to health and engaging in partnerships where joint action is needed. And as you know, engaging in research and development is engaging in partnership. No way a single organization can do it alone. So where does our engagement of research in research start from? But many of uh, the activities of WHO were governed by one of the eldest advisory committee of in WHO, which is called the ACHR, Advisory Committee on Health Research, which was established in 1959. So I looked at what, what to have a, is the track record of, the, of this committee, which hasn't met uh, since 2010, actually. Uh, in 1965, it was behind the creation of IAC for cancer research. In 72, the program of research on reproductive health in 74, establishment of TDR. In 83, establishment of CORED. In 87, the Global Forum on Health Research. And, uh, and in 2010, it oversaw the production of a WHO Global Strategy on Research for Health. And I nearly forgot it, that it also paved the way to the establishment in 99 of the Alliance for Health Systems and Policy Research. So a lot of, uh, of uh, the, the global policy places that you can see where uh, have uh, originated from, from uh, ACHR. So more recently, of course, there has been new actors coming on research, naming the Gates Foundation, for example, who has, who has uh, brought a billion into R&D. And therefore, uh, the role of WHO in this sphere has been less visible, of course, as you know. <laughs> Research, like many, uh, many other stakeholders, are like uh, um, butterflies. You know, when you see a big pot of money somewhere, it attracts a lot of attention. 
So the attention has gone maybe west instead of saying here. But we do continue to, to provide a, a forum for discussion of research and development through the, the Commission on, um, on, uh, um, on Intellectual Property uh, Innovation and Public Health, which was chaired by, uh, by President, ex-President uh, Ruth Dreyfus, and which, uh, which uh, recommended in their report in 2006 that there should be a global strategy and plan of action on research and development, which came to bear in 2008. Then the report of a CWG already mentioned in 12, the work plan, the strategic work plan and the follow-up of his research has been going on since 2013 and in particular we have worked uh, diligently to establish the Global Health R&D Observatory. Now at this point, I don't know what will come out as this assembly. Is it the time that the agenda moves somewhere else? I frankly, to tell you the truth, I don't know. We seem to be in, deadlock, in a deadlock at WHO as far as the discussion of R&D are progressing. I hope that Member State will find an avenue to resolve this deadlock so that the work continues to progress. Thank you, Maripol. Ambassador Patriota, you have been actually a champion for empowering WHO in that agenda of coordination and leadership on the R&D agenda. You've even invested, Brazil has invested into the uh, demonstration project fund. W what's your perspective on um, your wish for R&D outcome at the World Health Assembly? Well, thank you very much uh, for having me here. Um, all these are very difficult questions. Um, first, I also bought a little part of the Constitution to read out to you, uh, which is Article 2, that states that in order to achieve its objective, the functions of the organization shall be in little n to promote and conduct research in the field of health. So there is a clear mandate for the WHO. Whether it's in a position or not to conduct research is, of course, uh, another question. Um, I think the issue of R&D has been uh, in every, on everybody's mind for many, many years. Uh, there are barriers to a real in-depth discussion. One of them is that you would have to actually tackle the issue of intellectual property, for example and the complex regulatory framework that sort of drives research and development in different directions, either in the direction of more access and affordability or in the di direction of greater returns and uh, stronger monopolies. Uh, so I think this is where we're at. It's a huge discussion. In the CWG, we are a little bit frustrated because the substantive elements of the report that came from this process that Dr. Keeney sort of mentioned the historical process coming from many years back, uh, the outcome of it right now it has been uh, reduced to concrete project, uh, projects, six concrete projects, uh, the PDPs, uh, which I'm, I'm happy to support. Uh, one of them has a Brazilian institution involved, uh, Fiocruz, so, and there are, out of six, there's one from Brazil, one involving South Africa, another involving India. So you can see that there's also a, a good balance between the North and the South, uh, and they are interesting projects, but they do not discuss systemic issues related to R&D. So, so I think there's a void there. The observatory is an interesting step forward. It's a concrete initiative. Uh, supposedly, when it's up and running, uh, fully up and running, it will uh, provide uh, the basis for uh, WHO to have a more proactive uh, uh, position in terms of suggesting what would be priorities in terms of research and development that would connect to real needs of people in different places, uh, especially in developing countries where there is greater needs, greater unmet needs. So that should be a, a guide guideline for research and development. Uh, people claim that you cannot establish guidelines for the private sector research and development. They are at the end of the chain. But of course, you could influence usually, for example, public sector uh, investment in R&D, and that's a huge chunk if you take uh, the, 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 the developed countries, the OECD countries, they uh, spend huge amounts of money. Just take the NIH from the US, for example, it's huge. So, uh, but of course, there is resistance. All these, uh, this conversation touches upon very sensitive issues. So there's resistance to giving WHO uh, any sort of important role in terms of establishing priorities based on disease burden and health needs. Because uh, they feel, I think some countries feel, that this should be a market-driven, uh, R&D should be market-driven, market opportunities. And here and there, you will see that they will 
talk about market failures, and then you have to compensate for the failures, but you don't ever discuss uh, the system as a whole. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a lengthy uh, conversation. Uh, I think we need to have a broader conversation on the system that, uh, that drives R&D. Um, the prospects are not great right now for WHO in terms of discussing uh, real discussion, but I think you have a new driver which has captured the interest of some of the powerful uh, countries in the area of health technology, which is the AMR discussion. So for AMR, there's an opening because AMR is perceived to be a health security threat, a global threat. So here there is some sort of movement from the major countries in order to provide a real discussion, funding, a stewardship framework that looks very much like an R&D treaty, the treaty that we never managed to have as a mandate for WHO in the CWG, but they are now willing to discuss something very similar to that so long as it's confined to the AMR discussions because AMR is of interest. We have Jim O'Neill, uh, the person who, who device the BRICS uh, logo, the name, uh, he is involved and he's pushing for this agenda is becoming very visible. So AMR is a driver for pushing a more serious discussion on R&D. We have a high level panel established by Ban Ki-moon in New York with a series of high level people from all corners of the world, multi-stakeholder, also contributing from private sector, NGOs, everybody. There's 180 submissions and it will produce recommendations which I think will allow us to to uh, sort of drive this discussion back up again from where to where it should be. So we have some interesting prospects, and I think CWG should uh, analyze and properly uh, examine the outcome of the high-level panel because we are going to get some very interesting, an interesting set of recommendations that can push this agenda forward. And I think there's a reality of exhaustion of new drugs, new medicines, uh, expensive treatments uh, out of reach, and so I think the discussion will, based on the reality of of people's unmet needs and disease burden, I think the discussion will come back to the surface again. Thank you. Can you, I mean, Zika has actually made a significant impact in the region you represent. Can you maybe illustrate this in the context of Zika? Well, I think Zika, uh, first it proves that you're never completely prepared for a new emergency and that the emergencies, they don't follow the same pattern. Zika is very different from Ebola, for example. Uh, it has a vector. The vector uh, covers uh, half the globe, so uh, many, many countries and, and a huge population can be exposed uh, very quickly to, to the Zika issue. It's not confined to Brazil. It started in Brazil. It demonstrates the importance of uh, a public health system that is strong enough, not only in terms of delivering of accessibility and affordability, but that also connects with good statistics uh, and also uh, has a component of R&D that is sort of nationally owned. Uh, even if you do partner with the private sector and other countries, I think it's, nothing, it's very important that you have a base uh, in your own country for an R&D because thanks to all these factors, uh, in Brazil when Zika uh, surged, we were in a position to identify the correlation between the infections especially in pregnant women, and then the consequence of the uh, microcephaly in newborn children. Uh, Zika had occurred in other countries without this association having been detected. So it, it shows that you need uh, a, a public uh, health system that is very strong to begin with, and, and the importance of that. And now we can also push our, our health research institutes to accelerate uh, the production of vaccine because uh, we have them. Uh, and of course, they have good relations with other uh, health researchers. Uh, it's usually the public ones, so it's the CDC in, in the US, it's Institute Pasteur, uh, Malaysia. As if you look at it, they're all public. So you see how the public system, it really comes to the fore when you have an emergency. So you have to rely on them. You cannot abdicate and weaken your public health system uh, thinking that the big uh, private companies will take its place, it will not. Thank you. We'll come back to some of the matters you've, um, you've raised. And in particular, I think that uh, now is the time to hear from Suri, who um, has uh, been a member of the expert uh, advisory group uh, to the um, UNSG high-level panel on access. And I think it'd be great from you s f to hear from you, Suri, about your perspective on this, what could be uh, a bit uh, the cross-cutting outcomes of the conversation this year, this week at the World Health Assembly, but also uh, what are the implications for R&D and innovation models? Okay, 
Thank you. Um, so first, let me thank the Geneva Center for Security Policy and the Global Health Technologies Coalition for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. Um, I want to also make clear that I don't represent the uh, UN high-level panel, uh, but I am certainly, I've been involved every step of the way, and so what I would like to do is offer a few personal reflections on some of the discussions that have taken place in the context of the, the World Health Assembly. Um, so I thought I would offer three points to get the discussion going. I think first, um, picking up on what Mary Paul was talking about, I think it's important to note that the, the creation of the high-level panel perhaps signals a broadening of the conversation around innovation and access to medicines to the broader UN system in a way that I hope will be very useful. Um, I would like to believe that that is not a, a shift in forum, but a broadening of the conversation and a way to try to engage a number of ministries who actually have a very significant impact on innovation and access to medicines, but aren't always engaged in those discussions or don't necessarily see that they are. So I'm talking about ministries of finance, ministries of science and technology, um, and ministries of trade. Uh, and so I hope that this panel will offer an opportunity to help those ministries to engage in a more productive way. It's not always helpful uh, the way some ministries engage, and so I hope that that, that will be a useful um, broadening. That said, I think everyone agrees that WHO remains a very central and essential um, organization and arena for discussions on R&D, uh, not only for leadership and convening, as Marie Paul was mentioning, but also for agenda setting, for priority setting, for establishing norms and standards. And also in many ways, of course, WHO plays the function of the, the regulatory authority of last resort. So many, many different functions that only WHO can play, and I think that recognition is, has been clear throughout the process. Uh, the second point I wanted to raise was that there has been very widespread engagement in the work of the high-level panel. Um, as uh, Ambassador Patriota mentioned, there have been 180 submissions, really coming from all levels of countries, high, low, and middle income, uh, public, private, nonprofit sector, um, and a deep, deep interest, I think, across the world. We had uh, two public consultations in London and in Johannesburg, and I see some familiar faces from those two meetings. Um, all of the information is available online. The webcasts are available online, so I think much of the information is publicly available. And I think the types of concerns that were raised in those consultations also reflect um, a very widespread concern with the way the current innovation system is functioning. There were concerns raised with high prices, um, with, for example, the uh, publication of clinical trial results, both positive and negative, concerns raised around the transparency of uh, patent data, um, as well as many proposals for new models of innovation, whether at the uh, level of a company or a PDP, all the way up to the global level. Um, so many, many different suggestions on the table, as well as an expression of a lot of concern. Uh, the last point I would like to make is that I think there are, are two very important um, themes that have emerged. So again, I cannot guess what the outcomes will be, and the, the panel is still deliberating and debating what those outcomes will be, but I think there are two key themes that I heard repeatedly throughout the consultations. The first is the importance of building inf affordability into the R&D process from the very beginning through the principle of delinkage, so that we find alternate ways of financing R&D that do not rely on high prices of the end product. And of course, what this implies and suggests very clearly is that what you then need is public funding and also greater public leadership and public engagement in what has primarily been a market-driven R&D system over the last uh, 60 or 70 years. The second major theme that I would identify is the importance of ensuring adequate public return on public investment. So if we're expecting the public sector to put more money into R&D, then we need to be sure that at the end of the day, the public will benefit. And what I mean by that is not necessarily only publics in high-income countries, but actually the global public, so people in, in all countries of the world. So I hope that these are two themes um, that will be taken up by the HLP, but we'll all have to wait for the final report to find out. Thank you, Sorry. You um, also have published on considerations in establishing a new global fund, so the financing aspect of research and development. There are various proposals for this. Uh, can you maybe uh, uh, tell us uh, from just big, big picture, what are the principles that need to be followed for this? Thanks. So there, there are, of course, many different discussions for global funds for AMR, global funds, uh, a global fund based at TDR, uh, a global fund to address epidemics of, or diseases, pathogens of epidemic potential, I believe is the current phrasing that's being used. And in some ways it's very exciting because we have been, many of us have been arguing for a global R&D fund for many years and suddenly it seems that we may have two, three, perhaps even more 
created sometime in the next uh, in the next few years. Um, I think there are uh, three principles. Let me go back to my my three points uh, that are very important in the creation of these funds. So first, that you need to have, of course, adequate public investment, and that would be from governments from both high as well as low and middle income countries. And we know that Brazil, India, and South Africa contributed in a significant way to the WHO demonstration projects, um, but that many other countries, especially the middle income countries, uh, I think are we, we're hoping and waiting for other countries to step up, as well as high income countries, of course. Um, secondly, going back to the concept of public return on public investment, the public already invests very much in R&D, but there's a lot of dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction that we don't actually get uh, as much out of the system as we want, and that, in fact, public investments, especially in early stage R&D, are often privatized uh, and serve private, for private, um, serve private benefits at the end of the day. So the question is, can we uh, make sure that in the operation of any new global fund, which will be primarily funded through public and philanthropic money, can we make sure that that money will, in fact, deliver public returns? And we've seen that in a number of areas there has been a lot of public investment, not only in early stage but also in late stage R&D, certainly in the Ebola crisis we saw that, um, and in Zika as well, uh, in the neglected diseases. There are a number of areas where in fact public money has played a dominant role. So it's certainly, um, we have the norms and we have the um, experience to know how to manage those outcomes so that they're, they're better for, um, they de deliver more benefits for public health. Uh, the last point I wanted to make was that you can imagine if we have two or three firms, uh, funds, excuse me, two or three major funds created, that could create problems, that could create uh, overlap, inefficiencies, it could create unhelpful competition for funds. Uh, but I believe it does not have to be that way. And if the governments who actually control the purse strings are willing to commit to uh, providing adequate financing for a number of funds, uh, you do not have to have unhelpful competition be three, between the three. I think what's critical, however, is that the three, two or three funds, depending on how many do get created, uh, all of these funds operate on a common set of principles, a common set of norms and principles. And what might some of these principles be? Of course, uh, ethical conduct of research, uh, globally equitable access to the end products, encouraging open innovation models so you can have knowledge shared more quickly and more broadly. Um, scientific rigor in the selection of projects, and last but not least, legitimate, transparent, and accountable governance. I think these are principles that could be applied to any global fund, regardless of the particular problem that they're created to address. Thank you. We'll look forward afterwards to hear whether that's a likely development out of the World Health Assembly or not, and at what, at what pace would this uh, work. But I'm turning now to David. And um, particularly, David, I think you bring to us a, a wealth of experience spanning uh, public research, uh, private uh, R&D uh, uh, um, companies, and now a path. From your experience, um, from this various perspective, what do you think has changed in the last decade on, on the R&D agenda? In particular, I mean, in terms of cross-sector collaboration, what are good models, and what do you think um, comes ahead um, going forward. Great, thank you. So um, let me also um, thank uh, GCSP and GHTC for allowing me to bring in three different sectors into the conversation. I'll be honest with you, that change has been nothing short of remarkable over my career in terms of what I've seen. I started working on malaria vaccines um, as an intramural scientist at the US NIH at a time when I needed to get funding for that work from the WHO. Um, and this was to do some relatively primitive work on vaccines for eliminating malaria. There was absolutely no interest from industry. There was actually, to be honest with you, very little interest from the public sector in funding that research. There were no product development partnerships to develop products for low resource settings, no philanthropic funding to share costs and risks with industry. And the way that we work with industry was friendships between scientists which ultimately meant that development came to a screeching halt as soon as senior management in those companies were brought in to seek funding to, to advance those into clinical development. But then as the MDGs and other public health agendas um, came in about a decade ago, we then really entered an era of funding priorities for things such as menafravax, for meningitis A, um, for RPSS, for malaria vaccines. And both of those were directed solely at low resource settings, not high income markets. We saw uh, philanthropic funding along with public funding 
for translational research and product development. We saw a technology roadmap, some of them driven by the WHO for vaccines and drugs, that charted a prioritized pathway, which now has led to almost 500 neglected um, disease products in the development pipeline. And we saw engagement from the private sector in taking discovery research to um, product introduc introduction through a plethora of public and private partnerships, through um, um, product development partnerships, and a variety of other models um, across um, sectors. We also saw things like ADPs and public financing mechanisms that successfully accelerated the introduction of products into dual markets, primarily through, through tiered pricing. Um, we work with governments, the private sector, academic institutions, philanthropic foundations, and basically anyone else who could bring value to the table who was really willing to share the risk and the costs in developing products and taking those products to scale. Um, all that said, I think we're starting to see some clear signs of donor fatigue in this model. Perhaps in part because we've been actually, I think, quite successful in the work that we've done, and perhaps because the priorities have somewhat changed with the MDGs, and in part because maybe some of the hardest, most challenging, most expensive, and highest risk problems still remain. To the topic of this panel, perhaps what's most at stake at this 69th World Health Assembly is whether we've really reached an inflection point on this journey, whether we finish the work of the MDGs while tackling the work of the SDGs, and whether we remain on track for really meeting some of the goals such as the grand convergence of 2035, and how in that setting do we actually broaden the agenda now to include the R&D needs for global health security. You speak about the transformation in uh, recent years, but what, what you did not speak too much about the system the, the model itself. Um, how, how do you envisage sustainable approaches to global R&D? So, <laughs> clearly, as I mentioned previously, it really comes down, I think, to adequate, consistent, predictable funding to meet the needs of those product development activities. Um, but that said, I think there are a number of factors that can sustain the goals that we've made in the global health R&D. And many of those have to do with managing the risks and uncertainties that are actually under our control. So how can we clearly state the goals and objectives that don't change because someone new comes to the helm and decides they want to go in a different direction, but really only change when new data emerge or when a, an assumption thought to be valid is shown to actually be invalid. And there's a real strategic need to change direction. We need to really sit down and clearly state success criteria, which if met, will come with reliable commitments of support, and that be regulatory um, approval, policy recommendations, public financing, et cetera. I think we also clearly can define measurable objective shared met metrics that align the value proposition to a diverse set of stakeholders that are involved in global health and to allow very transparent prioritization. So we're all on the same page in terms of what our goals are. And as Marie Paul mentioned, I think also really quite important is effective real-time information and sharing. I think it's clear that the um, best global health R&D um, budget right now is basically we're in a zero sum, some gain for resources. And given the increasing costs to do this work, this likely will translate in a net-to-net -net year decrease in the resources that we have to do this work. So to increase the probability of technical and regulatory success of the current global health R&D pipeline um, in the current environment, what we really need to be able to do is to be able to identify the risk and uncertainty and manage that as effectively as we can. Thank you, David. I'm sure there will be further question in this direction, but let me turn now to Bernard. Uh, Bernard, you at uh, the helm of the Drug for Neglected Disease Initiative has, have been known uh, 
for the last decade for delivering drugs uh, for the most neglected diseases. Now it appears that you're actually partnering with WHO to foster the development of new antibiotics in response to the rise of uh, antimicrobial resistance, uh, which is now considered one of the major threats to um, global health uh, in general. Can you uh, maybe tell us more about the objective, what led to the creation of what is now called GARD, this partnership, and um, what you aim to deliver <coughs> with WHO and other partners? Thank you. Uh, maybe I would like to start a little bit by the, the context and uh, saying that uh, uh, today the good news is that uh, innovation and access is really at, uh, at the core of the political agenda. So it's part of, the, of this process assembly, but it's, it will be part uh, next week of the G7 in September on the G20 and, and thanks to, to the UN high-level panel to be part of the General Assembly end of September. And this, I think, is unique. Uh, and for me, uh, I'm involved in this topic for quite a lot of years. It's very similar to the, the period of the uh, year 2000, 2001, that, uh, when access was really the big issue. And, 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 and this uh, has delivered the uh, Global Fund, has delivered Gavi, has delivered PEPFAR, and quite a lot of initiatives. So I hope that uh, this will be an opportunity to change uh, fundamentally a little bit the things. And all, all, of course, it's thanks to to Ebola and more recently uh, Zika is thanks to the recognition of the, of the problem of antimicrobial resistance. That is not new. Uh, it's just the fact that today uh, we accept to describe uh, a problem that is uh, already uh, started to be documented for, for, for decades. So my second point is uh, uh, after a relatively short period with DNDI, 13 years, we have uh, learned some, some lessons uh, that could be useful for, for this. Uh, we have learned that we, we could uh, develop a, a product, we can implement research and development at a lower cost with uh, maybe a more efficient uh, uh, system, uh, applying uh, the principles that we always mention, and we all mention the principles that are well described in a, in a SIGWID process. So a series of principles such as uh, open innovation, uh, uh, such as uh, delinkage, so, uh, so separating the cost of uh, R&D to the final cost of the product, securing affordability of the product, or supporting, facilitating uh, a lot of collaboration between public and private sector, but also between uh, partners in endemic countries, in uh, developing countries, and partners in the north. All these are key elements uh, uh, for, for the success. I think uh, we are obliged also to revisit permanently uh, where are the needs, where are the patient needs, and where are the priorities. And here, uh, because we are on the week of the World Assembly, according to me, the WHO has a, uh, has a major role to play here. It's not only to collect information in the R&D observatory, but it's to try to translate this information into priority setting. And if possible, even go a step further uh, and, and describing what we call in a, in a field of R&D, the target product profile. So the characteristic of the product that we need to develop to address uh, public health needs. I think for me, this element uh, is, is extremely important. Uh, as well uh, as uh, the, the aspect of coordination, because I think uh, the resources will be always limited, so we cannot afford to have dupli duplication so I think this uh, should be uh, present in, in the mind of decision makers, avoid uh, 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 duplication, and for this, we need some sort of coordination. And so it's in this context that with WHO, uh, DNDI has this idea to explore the possibility to, to incubate a new initiative on uh, antimicrobial resistance called GARD, Global Antibiotic Research Development Partnership. So this has been uh, uh, on the table during the last 12 months. With, we make a decision uh, in our board uh, of directors of DNDI in December, and we are already in, in the process to, to start building this initiative. Tomorrow evening, we will have a, a, an event to launch uh, this initiative. Uh, so we have received support from some countries, uh, as well as uh, from, from MSF to, to, to start this initiative. But uh, of course, what we want to apply is exactly the same principles. We have, uh, we have uh, the SIGWID principle in mind, 
uh, we want to respond uh, to specific needs. Probably we want to go uh, into field uh, where the private sector will be really tend to go, and to, uh, particularly to go alone. I, we hope that with our partnership they will be attracted to go into this field, but they will probably not go alone because there is no enough uh, uh, attractiveness in terms of, of, of business. Uh, and uh, and uh, of course, the, the last uh, but not least, uh, in the context of antimicrobial resistance, we have to think about affordability on one side, but also we have to think about rational use. So it's, it's exactly the, the complexity of this. It's not totally new because uh, we were involved uh, in developing uh, malaria treatment. Uh, I think it was really the same situation, the same for, for leishmanazis. We, we, uh, we, we have this rational, re risk, uh, rational use in mind when, when we develop strategy. But here maybe uh, this is uh, a little bit more difficult. And here again, we'll have to uh, need the guidance from, from the WHO and the member states. Thank you, Bernard. Just a quick question. Is the GARD model, in your view, the, the solution to the model for R&D in the future? No, I think we are exactly in the same situation than we when we set up the DNDI uh, 30, years ago, uh, 30 years ago. We, we always say that we are not the solution to the problem. We are trying to develop a new model of collaboration to deliver product, expecting that this model will uh, uh, stimulate uh, others uh, to, 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 to go into this field, but as well as uh, this model will, will influence uh, the environment, because what we need uh, is, uh, is, is something much, much more sustainable. So sustainable in terms of funding, so we have to think about what sort of funding mechanism uh, uh, will be in place to, to assure this sustainability, but also we have to think about having a, a framework in place uh, uh, that will, uh, uh, will, will stimulate R&D. And when I say one framework, is even if the, the different situations are quite different between IMR, between emerging infectious diseases, or uh, neglected diseases, I think the principles are the same. So we are expecting that WHO uh, will play a role in setting up this framework and, uh, and guarantee that uh, the member state uh, engage uh, in the efforts of uh, stimulating R&D uh, will accept to uh, implement the principle that uh, will be on the table. Thank you, Bernard. As I invite you all to prepare your um, questions, I uh, want to note how we have really a, a vote of confidence for WHO's role here around the table, not necessarily in driving the research itself, but at least in forcefully driving the principles for research and development and the agenda. So um, sounds like there is um, much subject for conversation. As you can see, the conversation went in very different angles, and I invite you all to reflect the diversity here with questions, please. Hello, I'm Manuel Martin with Universities Allied for Central Medicines. And my question is, considering the current uh, fragmentation in R&D efforts globally and at the WHO, uh, what promise does the panel see in an R&D agreement to bring together these myriad of ad hoc efforts? Thank you. I suggest we take a few questions and then ask uh, panelists to respond. I see a question in the back here. Hello, thank you very much, Julius Walker. I'm a medical doctor from Germany. Uh, Dr. Sue, I have a question directed at you regarding the point you made in ensuring adequate public return. I would like to have some clarifications on what the public investment is. Is it only grants and such, or is it seen as the prices we pay due to IP as well? Thank you. Hi, this is William New at Intellectual Property Watch here in Geneva. And uh, uh, greetings to many of you who have uh, been um, uh, written about in IP Watch uh, over the years and or have uh, helped us to understand better and be able to educate others. So 
Just very quickly, I, I was wondering for any panelist who's involved in this question on the demonstration projects, including one involving uh, DNDI, so they're not getting the funding they need. Can we leapfrog this stage, or does this become a, a roadblock to moving to the next? I mean, they're, as I understood them, to be a, a providing information about how to move forward, and we can learn from these projects. If that, how critical is that funding in this WHA? Um, and then secondly, um, Bernard, the question, the, the proposal that you're talking about, I don't think I'm familiar with that one. Is that an issue at, on the table this week, uh, the new, uh, new initiative that you're describing? Thank you. May I suggest Marie-Paul answer the first question, Suri the second, and Bernard the third? So in terms of uh, fragmentation of R&D activity in W, so I, I actually disagree with the fact that they would be fragmented because we have, in terms of R&D, uh, we, we have the CWG agenda. We have some recent, more recent work on, uh, on diseases, uh, infectious disease of epidemic potential and then antimicrobial resistance. So these, these projects are connected by the fact that they they all want to uh, implement the same principles for research, the same as were uh, mentioned by, by Suri or, or, or by uh, Bernard about open innovation, about delinking, about uh, uh, all what we have in, in terms of uh, policy for research in the CWG re report. So um, they are also linked very much by the, by the R&D observatory which will, when fully developed, which will bring to the surface in a unified way the uh, information on what is happening in the area of research everywhere in the world in terms of pipeline, in terms of funding, and, uh, and we hope will help for the prioritization. So uh, we are also putting in place, we have discussion uh, during the assembly with the member states about what kind of coordination mechanism we will put in place but we are, we are uh, clearly decided to put something in place as quickly as possible, starting this year, uh, in order to bring to the surface and to bring to the attention of, uh, of the funders and of the implementers of research what are the main uh, problems for research to tackle. So um, um, we, you know, I, I, I really think that uh, we are moving all this initiative in a unified front. Uh, if I may just uh, say something about the DEMO project in the in their future. Some of the projects will be able to continue even if there is no funding coming through the CWG. I, I'm, you know, I'm confident that, for example, with a project of DNDI, if money is not coming from there, there will be other ways. And member states may even decide that they prefer to fund DNDI directly for this project. Some others, I, I think, will have great difficulties, and I would mention in particular the project which is hosted at Andi in, in Africa. And, I, and I'm really uh, worried that if this project doesn't get any more money, it, it, will, it will have to close. So uh, my, my hope would be that uh, the member states together will find a way in the, their discussion uh, this week to, uh, to at least bring to the surface one more year for all the six demonstration projects so that they can they can continue and, and, and demonstrate actually what we want them to demonstrate. Uh, so addressing the question of what exactly is public investment in R&D, I think the literal way of thinking about it is the proportion of global R&D investment, which is estimated at about $240 billion, uh, which comes from the public sector. So that estimate is now about 40% from the public, 60% from the private. The numbers are not very solid, but those are the, I would say, the, the most recent estimates. Um, but as, as you rightly pointed out, the question is who exactly pays for R&D both at the beginning and the end of the process, and the global pharmaceutical market is now at about $1 trillion per year. So I think one of the questions that we're wrestling with is can you structure, restructure, redesign, uh, reform the current R&D system to actually move some of that $1 trillion earlier into the R&D process so that at the end of the day we don't have to pay a trillion dollars um, for end products and at the same, same time we can dramatically expand access to those products to, to a global population of end users. So I think the, the point that, that you raised is absolutely correct that in fact the public pays at the beginning 
for R&D and the public pays at the end, can we be smarter about the way that we're investing in R&D so we have both access and we have health, me health needs that are met and that we can spend less money at the end of the day? Now, I would like to react also on, also on this point because uh, I think uh, Guillermo mentioned that uh, all countries are interested in antimicrobial resistance because of security issue, but I think all countries are also interested on, uh, on the cost of the product today. Uh, I think the public uh, health system are under too much pressure. They cannot afford to pay uh, anymore for hepatitis C drugs or for oncology. So I think this is another opportunity uh, uh, to, to really ask the difficult question on, on, uh, on the new rules of the games that are necessary to, to, to organize uh, the, the R&D environment. And to your specific uh, question on a, on, on a guard, uh, um, so this project will not be launched during the assembly. Tomorrow evening, you are welcome to uh, uh, an event that we organize at 6.30. 6 I think you have an invitation uh, in this room. So it's, uh, it's an initiative that we, we started already uh, to develop during the last few, few months. Uh, uh, to, tomorrow is just a symbolic uh, launch of the event outside of the assembly, but uh, not, by, not totally by chance during this week because we want to attract the, the member states. Uh, the, the objective is to have, a, a, today we have a, we have a group of, 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 of country uh, supporting uh, these uh, uh, initial uh, steps on the project, but the objective is to, to have a much broader group uh, uh, being involved uh, in the funding, but also in the implementation, because I think uh, uh, all, all, all these strategies require a lot of collaboration from, from different parts of the world. Further questions? Yes. Hi, Caitlin Christensen from PATH, and thanks to the panel for your comments. I wanted to come back to this issue of public sector funding and kind of a question across the panel, but Suri, I was hoping you could further elucidate what you mean by um, adequate public return. Are you thinking of metrics like cost per deli averted, or are you thinking of number of products? What does adequate public return really mean? And then also, as we know, all public sector money is not equal, and in an era where public sector funders are often moving towards more constrained mechanisms and instruments of funding that often have a very low low tolerance for risk. I'm just curious if you can comment, maybe Bernard and David or others on the panel, what are the types of public sector funding that are best suited for spurring innovation in R&D? Thanks. Hi, uh, Chase Perfect from Coalition Plus. Um, so a lot of the attention has justifiably been placed on patent barriers and um, open innovation that would allow um, al allow competition in the absence of patents uh, as an end product of some of these projects, but there would also remain um, challenges in poorer countries of registration of the drugs and in richer countries of market exclusivity to existing regulatory laws. So I was wondering if um, that final step of how are you going to uh, introduce competition or provide generic access if you are able to create some open, uh, open products, um, given that there are these, these laws for regulatory exclusivity, particularly on biosimilars, so. Maybe, Suri, you want to start answering the question of what's an adequate return, and I'll invite other participants to start. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a great question, and it's also a terrific question for broader debate, I think, at the assembly. So getting back to the question you initially posed, well, what is it that we want out of the assembly? I think this is the place for countries and, and others to really debate what is it that we want out of an R&D system in the first place. And, uh, you know, if we think back to maybe 20 years ago, we actually did not have a global norm that there ought to be universal access to HIV, uh, HIV treatment, for example, and that's something that has also changed dramatically since David Caslow began his career. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's been a tremendous shift, but I think that shift has also affected the R&D system more broadly. What is it that we want? We want new products, of course, uh, but we want products that will address 
um, the needs of not only those who have capacity to pay, but those who maybe don't have capacity to pay in this, in this uh, system. So we want it to address certain, I would say, high priority public health needs, but I'm not the one to say what those precise needs are. That's why we have WHO. Um, but certainly there are many needs that, that aren't currently being addressed. I think one of the other areas where we're currently not seeing adequate return is in affordability, right? So if we have products where the public sector has invested deeply in um, early stage research and basic research and some clinical trials where the public sector is subsidizing through tax credits on clinical trials, it seems to me very logical that at the end of the day, the public should benefit by getting widespread uh, low-cost access to the final products that are developed. Now, this doesn't mean that there should not be a reward for the inventors. I think we do have to offer um, attractive rewards to incentivize innovative effort, and that innovative effort is going to come from um, many, many different places, not just from a handful of PDPs, for example. I think it's going to be thousands of different firms and academic labs and, and, and um, nonprofit players that will all contribute to the actual innovation process. But if we've had significant public investment, we should be getting uh, a return in terms of access to the end products. In our current systems, we actually don't have measures to provide for that. We have measures that allow private firms to actually um, build on knowledge that's been generated with public funds uh, and, and privatize it, close it off, and disallow other people from using it. So my hope is that we can uh, insist in, in these debates that we have at the assembly, what are the norms that should guide the current R&D system, that the notion of public return on public investment would be one that is supported and advanced um, and advanced more widely. So, so maybe just a quick comment with respect to public funding and this notion of sources of public funding. Um, certainly, um, it needs to come from multiple sources. Um, but what's really needed is a seamless line of sight of funding so that as you switch from one public funder to the next, there's not a lot of uncertainty and risk associated with that transition. There's not a lot of time to go through those. And I think what we're seeing is, is what we could benefit from is better coordination of that line of sight lining up you know, the early development public funders with the middle development public funders, with the late, with those that are involved, and that that line of sight is clearly spelled out, that the success metrics needed to go from one public funder to the next are really spelled out, and you reduce the uncertainty risk and time during those transitions between public funders. Does anybody want to answer the question related to uh, regulatory pressures? <laughs> no, there is one question was on open, open innovation. Uh, I think on open innovation, of course, we just mentioned open, open innovation in a list of, of, of principles, but uh, of course it will require a lot of time to talk about open innovation. But I could at least mention uh, three aspects that are linked to, to this topic. One, one is that uh, at a discovery level, uh, there is a lot of advantage to share information to have access to to large uh, number of libraries so i think here of course open innovation will will speed up the process of innovation as i, I would say the second aspect is uh, open source uh, in terms of clinical development well, this is linked a little bit also tr to transparency but this also is a way to 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 stimulate uh, 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 and and facilitate uh, r and d but, but the third aspect that is very linked, uh, particularly to the field of infectious diseases, is probably we'll have to pull uh, uh, li patents and, and pull licensing. Eh? Most of the disease will require uh, uh, um, uh, several, several therapeutics, se several drugs to, to develop a treatment. So the example of the medicine patent pool, of course, will be very useful to implement in, in many, other, uh, many other areas. You know, in, in terms of, uh, of return, I'm always struck by the fact that uh, um, the scientists in the academic world, many of them think that they would, will earn a fortune, and they think it's normal that they all earn a fortune, a fortune through the exploitation of their work. You know, some of you may know, I worked actually in, uh, in, uh, in pharmaceutical research in, in industry, and I, wo I was working in the biotech when I was much, much younger. And I even had patents. But I, it was absolutely normal that all the rights on this patent belonged to the company because I got a salary. I was paid for that. 
So the result of my work belong to the company. Now we see the people and the scientists doing research in university, they all think that although they get their salary from the university, they all think that their result they can just sell and try to make profit with the, the private sector. So there we have also an issue. Yes, you know, there should be a just reward, but also at the same time, the money which has been invested by the public sector, there should be something on the rights on this product which come back to the, to the, to the, to the public sector. And, and I think this discussion should be held more broadly about what is, a, is a, um, an appropriate return for companies, for universities, but also for the individuals. Thank you. Any further questions? Hi, I'm Alexander LaChapelle, medical student from Canada. I was just wondering if, in your opinions, the, uh, there was any role for uh, collaboration with the private sector in this issue, or if the private sector should be kept out of any uh, R&D in global health? No, that's, that's an easy one, you know. I, I think uh, you can really have good and equitable uh, partnership with industry. You know, the people in industry are no, no better, no worse than, than any of us. But I think the rules have to be set. Uh, WHO, for example, we have been working on a number of projects we have, but every time we have worked with an industry on some research and development program, we have a memorandum of, understand of understanding which states very clearly what will be the benefit to the public sector in this, in this collaboration. So I think partnerships are always possible, but provided the rules of engagement uh, and what comes back to the public sector is clearly stated, is written, is not left to a discussion at the end. Can I add to that? Um, yeah. I, I think the, the private sector uh, is completely in uh, whenever returns are high. Um, and there's a sufficient amount of subsidies coming from taxpayers. Uh, and then they have a position of uh, exclusivity in the market once they have a blockbuster drug or product. And of course, the private sector is out when returns are low, when the capacity to pay of populations and needs are low, when there is uh, not enough demand or when people cannot pay the prices that are being set. So I think there isn't, it's kind of like a false um, description of reality to say that we're not bringing the private sector in. I think we're trying to bring the private sector in under a different uh, sort of dynamic to make the private sector uh, become a more reasonable partner of the public sector because the public sector is suffering a hemorrhage from rising costs and rising demand. So, so I think that's the big issue and for that you need to read rediscuss certain elements of the regime that often the private sector feels it's not, it's untouchable. So you have to re-examine them because it's all very nice to have a lot of uh, belief in the capacity of science to innovate, but once there is an innovation of any value, it becomes a matter for uh, intellectual property lawyers and no longer a, a scientific question. I think many universities, for example, they filter uh, uh, there are research outcomes uh, in the course of the research. They have intellectual property offices, for example, installed within the grounds, the campuses. Uh, they analyze all the production to, to verify whether there's any promising outcome that may uh, ensue from these researchers that can be of commercial value so that they can sort of uh, prevent full disclosure prior to their uh, actual registration and patenting. So there's all these issues that need to be discussed. Collaboration uh, at the fundamental cycle of science is very open and global. All the scientists, they, they are very friendly to each other. They, they coordinate well, but up to a certain point. Then when you get closer to uh, product uh, breakthroughs, uh, this is no longer the case. There is, There will be uh, someone claiming to be uh, the proprietor of that particular product, uh, usually the company who is uh, in a capacity to pay and to protect, and protecting is also expensive. So I think the regime needs to come into play. Um, there is a lot of um, vagueness about the cost of private R&D. The books are not open for, ex for examination. This is a discussion that is held in the abstract. Companies claim that a new drug will cost such 
a number of billion dollars, but they, don't, they do not allow you to look at their, in their books. So this is confidential information. You don't really know how much they pay. You don't really know how much the prior stages of research that were probably based on public funding, uh, how much they benefited from that, uh, from workers that are funded, paid by the public sector, et cetera. So you don't have the view of the full cycle of research when it goes through the private sector. It's uh, clinical trials. You don't have access to, to the data. The data is treated as confidential. So you need to have uh, money to to, to register a, a similar drug, uh, you cannot use uh, the same trials that were performed for another one because the company uh, almost owns the, the data, the data is confidential. There's a lot of issues, uh, sharing is great, but that's not the reality of the market. The market is not, does not share, the, ma the market appropriates uh, anything that is of commercial value. So I think this needs to be discussed. And the global framework is not going in the direction of greater access and lower costs. It's going in the opposite direction if you have a look at chapters on IP and regulatory frameworks for drugs and health uh, treatment and the uh, new uh, bi-regional mega trade agreements of uh, the Pacific and the Atlantic. So you'll see how far they're advancing in, in the opposite direction. And I think that's a concern. Hi, I'm Dr. Inon Schenker. I'm heading a new program of global public health at Teva Pharmaceutical Industries, which you may not know, but Teva is the leader in generic medicine in the world and one of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies. I would not be taking the responsibility to address all the private sector issues that have just been raised, but I think that this is a very worthwhile uh, discussion and definitely I would like to ask two questions and then also to introduce perhaps a different way to look at some of the activities that private sector, specifically the pharmaceutical industry, is engaged with global public health at the moment. And just for the sake of openness, I was a former WHO staff member about 16 years ago. Um, to WHO, actually, you know, in the private sector, when we are considering what drug to develop, obviously the unmet need is the primary concern. So if you could elaborate a little bit about the deadlock that you've mentioned, what is the pipeline for WHO? And if there isn't one, and TDR, for example, is the only more straightforward research element of WHO, then, then maybe we can understand a little bit more why is it that the pipeline is so narrow. And perhaps the NDI could talk to the example of pediatric HIV treatment, where there is no commercial, there is no incentive for any uh, pharmaceutical company at any size really to develop uh, the necessary drugs, first line and second line, and yet you have been able to achieve actually great success, I think, in terms of putting together some of the companies. And I just want to end by suggesting a different model, and that is what we are trying to operate on, and that is actually a no loss, no profit type of a model. It's not a complete CSR approach, but it basically says that Teva is working currently on trying to answer a wish list. It's short, only five projects, one in under five-year-olds, uh, reducing the mortality, one in family planning, another is in HIV pediatric treatment. And what we are trying to consider is how could we not profit from any of those products, but actually share the financial risk in developing them. And interestingly, it seems that there are external donors, I won't mention them here, you know most of them, the big foundations and also other stakeholders who are willing to actually share that cost with a company that is considered to be possibly delivering, and yet the agreement and the ambassador had talked about specific regimens and agreements that need to be put in place where there is no interest upfront and a contractual agreement where there will be no profit. Thank you. Well, WHO itself has been involved in, in research and development, in product research and development over the past year. We have, for example, been in a 50-50 um, uh, partnership with PATH to develop the meningitis A vaccine, which is now has been rolled throughout Africa. We developed also um, uh, aerosolized uh, measles vaccine. Uh, more recently, we, um, we sponsored and conducted the efficacy trial of the Ebola vaccine in Guinea. So we can engage in, in research and development, but it is true that in terms of operation, uh, 
WHO may not be the, the easiest partner to engage in actual uh, physical R&D because we have uh, constraints about uh, recruitment, about handing of funds and all that. So for us, it's better to, part to, to collaborate with others like we collaborate now with, with DNDI. But the deadlock is, is, is due, I think, to the, to, the, to the fact that we have come to a, a, a stage where there is a wide recognition that there, I, there are limits in the, in the R&D model that we have been pursuing for so many decades. Indeed, uh, even high-income countries are struggling to, uh, um, uh, to pay the cost of the medicines which are developed and that are needed to treat their population. And you see uh, high-income countries have been trying to see how they could introduce the new hepatitis C treatment and how they could restrict potentially the number of people who have access just because otherwise it is just putting them, you know, the system bankrupt. So uh, there, there needs to be a discussion about how to, uh, to ensure that affordability of, of uh, these medicines is, uh, is actually a fact. I was interest also interested to see last uh, week in, in the newspaper that, uh, that uh, I think it was in the US, that some basic drugs to treat uh, non-communicable diseases had actually seen their price uh, multiply by 150% over the course of between 2011 and now. And this cannot be attributed to, uh, uh, to costs of research. These are old drugs. So, so unfortunately, we have a system where for many uh, products for the time being, the, the, what is seen as, uh, as the best price is the price that the market can bear. It is absolutely completely dealing with any cost of anything. It's not the case for everything, but uh, uh, for a few of them. So we will be holding, starting this year, a forum on, uh, on fair pricing. And, and we would like to discuss what are the, uh, what would be options and principle for fair pricing on pharmaceuticals. So this is about the prices of medicine which are way too high, but it is also, by the way, about prices of medicines which are way too low, because this exists also. Because we see, you know, um, uh, for example, antiretroviral treatment, as you know, have come to be completely affordable to something which are quite cheap now. But by pushing the, the price even further, we end up having uh, some of the producer ex exiting the market. And we end up having uh, monopolies. And then when you have a monopoly, again, the price can, can skyrocket. Some of the basic vaccines have come to be very cheap, at the mini at really at the limit of, of being just sustainable. So a fair pricing forum was to look at, uh, at what is a fair way of pricing and to avoid high cost and also make sure that the pharmaceutical industry who produce the, uh, the drugs still receive a fair return on their efforts. I just wanted to um, build on a few comments that, that other panelists have made today. I think we think about what are the uh, respective roles of the public and private sector. Of course, it varies a lot by product, but it's interesting to look at a couple case studies. So if we um, look at the Ebola vaccine that um, Marie Paul mentioned earlier, yeah, I didn't sleep on the flight, so you'll correct me if I get the details wrong, but I, I do believe that came out of a Canadian government investment, uh, was then transferred to a small biotech firm called New Link. Um, the trial that was run in Guinea was uh, run together with WHO with um, money from the Norwegian government, from MSF, from the Wellcome Trust, um, perhaps others that I'm forgetting. So primarily publicly financed. Uh, and this, is, this vaccine has now been licensed to Merck. And interestingly, it's being called the Merck vaccine. Um, but you can see there are a lot of different players in the development of this vaccine, and we still don't know it's not yet been licensed, so we don't know yet if it's going to be uh, fully successful. And, and, of course, Merck has the manufacturing capacity, and that's very important. And I think, I think they did play a very important role in bringing this product forward, but certainly they were not the only ones. And what we often don't have is a very clear picture of along these very long, complicated pathways from the very beginning of an R&D process to when a product reaches a patient, who has paid for what and who should benefit from, from the process. And so um, building on what Guillermo was saying, I think we need to have much more transparency, actually. We need to understand better all the different elements of the cost in order to have a rational discussion about what that return on either public or private investment should be. 
uh, for me personally, if a private company has made 95% of the investment and the public sector has made five, I'm not going to say, well, the private company should give everything away because I, would, I don't think that's a fair ratio. But if it's 50-50, that's a different story. If it's 75-25, that's still a different story. So, and then of course it also depends on where was risk taken, where was money given, was it private money, public money, was it venture capital? But, I mean, there are all these different important questions that are put on the table. But I think we need to think much more um, carefully about who is paying for what and who benefits at the, at the end of the day. Um, since Joel uh, encouraged us before we came into this room to converse amongst each other, I wanted to put Bernard on the spot <laughs> and ask him to tell us a little bit about the um, DNDI project with Farco on Hep C, because I think the 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 um, what has been done up to this point is that PDPs come in when there's no market for a product, and that can be for diseases uh, of epidemic potential. It can be for neglected diseases. Hep C is neither of those and yet you're engaged in a Hep C R&D project. So with the moderator's permission. <laughs> I would say in this field, there is two elements uh, that uh, have been crucial uh, to, to enter into this, this project that will probably move this project further. One is that uh, the most affected country today in the world is Egypt, uh, where there is 12% uh, of the adult population infected. And, and the consequences, uh, Egypt has decided to, to set up a very ambitious uh, public health program and to stimulate a pharmaceutical company to, to, to be really active on this field. So it's why today in Egypt, uh, the cost of treatment uh, is, uh, is less than 300 US dollars compared to the 100,000 uh, US dollars in, in the US. And the number of people being treated in Egypt is much more than the rest of the world. So it's the first element. The second element is that uh, uh, the field of, uh, of uh, hepatitis C was very rich in terms of innovation. The problem was that uh, this innovation was not translated into, uh, into access because very few people have access today. So we have reviewed the pipeline and we discovered that there is a lot of drugs or candidate drugs that are quite... Uh, uh, far advanced uh, in uh, development, but are, will not be developed because of uh, the market is controlled by only a few companies. So we just discovered that there is an incredible opportunity of a lot of science being there, so product being in phase two, or even some, sometime uh, in phase three, that will not be developed because of lack of, uh, of uh, market attract attractiveness. So this provides another uh, opportunity to try to develop a public health approach and, uh, and try to uh, develop uh, a regimen that uh, uh, will be uh, pan-genotyping, so we cover all the, the genotypes affecting hepatitis C, so making much more easy uh, the way you select your, your patients. And second, uh, uh, in fact, uh, being offered as a public health tool, so because it's, it's the price is low, there is no reason to, to just uh, select the more severe cases. So you can ob probably offer this treatment to all. So it's why we are, we are in this field. Uh, on a, I would say on a patient uh, needs appro uh, approach, but also on a, on a public health approach. Thank you. I think we're under time pressure. So I would like to uh, uh, suggest that we, uh, I see a, a very impatient question out there. So I'll suggest you ask your question as long as it's quick. And I will invite the um, contributors on the panel to actually weave an answer as appropriately into their concluding statements. Hi, I'm Shoshana Golden. I'm a master's of public health student at Yale University and an intern this summer at WHO. My question is, I've noticed an increasing lens of securitization being placed on global health R&D, particularly when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. And while this does draw a lot of high-level attention and engagement in the issue, I'm wondering what voices are lost by this overcrowding through the security lens, and how does this affect both the prioritization of global health R&D and the funding? Thank you for that question. I will now turn to your, our panelists for concluding statements. Do not feel obliged to answer this question. I suspect Marie-Paul or uh, especially Ambassador Patriota may actually want to address it, but um, I particularly would like you to take us back to 
What do you take from this conversation? The various perspectives on the panel have brought us in different directions. The participants have also broadened the conversation. What do we think we need to expect out of the upcoming cycle from World Health Assembly to G7, G20, and the General Assembly? Uh, can we expect something on the R&D agenda this year? I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about how WHO enables product development, not necessarily by doing um, R&D directly, but helping us to prioritize and provide a pathway to go forward. And the thing I wanted to highlight was a new committee that the WHO set up for product development of vaccines, the PVAC. And it was really to help prioritize where WHO should take its limited resources that can enable vaccine development. And there were three criteria, unmet need, a reasonable probability that the product would enter development in the next five to 10 years, and that there was a way that the WHO could enable the development of that. And so what they've been doing is just went through 114 vaccine projects and prioritized those into the top three or four and sat down and said, we will define what the preferred product characteristics are, which is a precursor to the targeted product profile. We will define what the clear clinical progression is to take that through development. And we will help define what the roadmap is in terms of the R&D priorities. And I can tell you both for RSV, for Group E strep and for Group A strep, this has been hugely enabling in terms of product development in those areas. Thank you very much. Well, just to take your question about AMR, I think it is opportune that AMR is seen as a question of health security, but it's much more than health security. Actually, AMR can can be uh, can be quite a problem for. Uh, for poor people first, because you know this is where also the, uh, in many places of the world the, the, the practices on infection prevention and control are the less well mastered and where you have the most chance of, of getting uh, a nosocomial infection if you come in contact with, uh, with uh, you know, the health facility. So it is a true agenda for everybody, including for developing countries. And, and if because of this, in, uh, of this pitch of health security, it fosters investment, well, fine, let's, let's, let's take this investment because it will benefit everybody. Now, what I'd like to have, I think, what I, I get out of this discussion and others is that there is a real enthusiasm about trying to move forward and finding, uh, redefining the way we work on R&D for, for uh, this, this product. So WHO is clearly only one part of a puzzle. We have normative work that we need to do that we are, I think, better placed for, to, to do than, than other stakeholders. David mentioned one, which is to define the target of a preferred uh, characteristics of, of new products needed for R&D, prioritization, uh, putting on the table what the priorities are, even if we can't finance them. These are things that WHO has done and will continue to, to move forward with. What I hope is that uh, the discussion at the World Health Assembly will, will allow uh, our member states to, to find uh, a consensus, some agreement that allow uh, us continue to, uh, to work in this, in this direction. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I would like to answer the question on securitization. I think that's a, a, great, uh, <laughs> a great question. Uh, securitization uh, is being used uh, to drive uh, many of the uh, relevant issues of this health assembly. Uh, actually, all of the important ones uh, have a securitization connotation behind them. So AMR clearly because of the threat uh, to human beings, um, but also the review of the international health regulations, which will be linked up with an AMR capacity uh, of national health systems that will be externally assessed, et cetera, et cetera. So it's additional commitments by member states to prioritize uh, fighting AMR, among other things. Um, so it's also an emergency sort of focused prioritization of the health agenda. Uh, the strong new pillar on emergency, which will be the outcome of this major reform of the WHO, um, much of the resources, uh, both human and, fi and funding and financial, will be going to this new uh, mega emergency pillar to the point that we have expressed concern as Brazil uh, as to whether uh, this will not weaken WHO's uh, fundamental role as a public health uh, standard setting normative uh, guidelines producing uh, sort of international organization because will it become a big uh, health emergency 
response unit of the UN, uh, you know, draining all other resources and all other capacities. Uh, the governance reform has a, this uh, impulse to centralize decisions in Geneva. This also comes from a concern from the Ebola experience, which uh, some thought that the fact that Geneva didn't really have the capacity to drive uh, directly command uh, responses of the African Regional Committee that was part of the uh, missing uh, loop in, in the bad, badly evaluated response of WHO. So they want to uh, overcome that by centralizing again all decisions in, in Geneva. That's also kind of a security concern. Then you have the issue of migrations, which is kind of embedded in the AMR because the superbugs, they come with the migrants from the developing world that are you know, flowing in large numbers into Europe, US, and other countries. So there's a bit of a, of a reaction to that. And, and I think the bad part of this is that um, security cannot be the major uh, driver of our, our prioritization. We need development to be. And uh, the issue of healthy lifestyles for all as we framed it in the SDGs. So I think counter to that, we have the SDG agenda. Uh, of course, uh, some of the countries who like security, they have managed to uh, include SDG 16, which allows for security to be an element there somewhere because it mentions peaceful societies. So, you know, um, but again, uh, AMR, if from a security perspective, a new antibiotic should not be used. It should be conserved as an antibiotic of last resort. From a public health perspective, any new antibiotic should be immediately used to save lives where needed. So you can see the tension in, in which the organization will be pulled in different directions because of this. And I think we have to really discuss it further. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Suri? Thank you. I, I, I would agree that there are certainly a lot of risks with the securitization of a number of topics in health. And by securitization, that often translates into protecting the interests of, um, of wealthier countries. And so I think there's a need to, to interrogate the concept, but also try to appropriate the concept. We are here at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Um, and, and I don't know how possible that is, to be honest. I think that remains to be seen. It, it depends on who's at the table. Uh, the concept of human security uh, is certainly much broader than we usually think of when we, when we hear the word security. Um, I think it's something to aim for. I think that the... Um, for me, emerging infectious diseases and antimicrobial resistance are social justice issues. They're not often framed that way. They're not often perceived that way, but they are, in my view, social, social justice issues. If we recall who suffered the most during the Ebola outbreak, it was not uh, Americans in Texas or in New York City who were nervous. Um, it was obviously people in West Africa. Uh, and so trying to strengthen the systems that we have to try to respond and pre you know, prevent and respond to those types of crises are very important, but we need to do them in a way that does not um, fall into some of these risks that the security framing creates. I'm not quite sure how to do that, but I, I do believe that the health assembly is not just about WHO. Uh, of course, it is about WHO, but, but the health assembly is the closest thing we have to an actual in-person physical convening of the global health community, whatever that is, whoever we are. And so it's at the health assembly that these debates play out, right, where we debate what does security mean or what are the pros and cons of that kind of framing. It's in this um, context where we debate what, uh, what do we want from an R&D system? What are the norms and principles that should drive that R&D system? And it's where governments, of course, are in the driver's seat at WHO, as I believe they should be, but are also very much engaging in many conversations with uh, non-state actors of various kinds. And, and so it's really here during this week that these types of debates play out and the norms get established. So what I hope for this week is really that we'll have more progressive norms on, um, on research and development, on access to medicines, and on emerging infectious diseases by the end of the week than at the start of the week. That might be a very tall order, um, but, but that's my hope. Okay, I will refer to, to two historical uh, events. One is, of course, it's a risk to use uh, security uh, as the only element, but it's also an opportunity. And I can, I can say that uh, the response to the uh, HIV crisis has really totally changed of, of scale when it has been considered as a security issue. So I think, of course, we have to jump into this opportunity, taking consideration, of course, the risk and, uh, and, 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 and considering a lot uh, the, the, the human rights uh, issue. My, my second reference is, is to a, a success story uh, within the WHO. I think during the last 35 years, I think the WHO has been successful 
in, in supporting uh, uh, the essential medicine policy and the list of essential medicines. I think this has been a clear success in many countries in the world. So today, I think to, to support the topic that we have discussed today, so to support the topic of, uh, of R&D and setting up priority, I will encourage the WHO to, to set up a list of missing essential medicines, missing essential vaccines, missing es essential diagnosis. This could be really a tool to support uh, some prioritization at the international level as well as a national level. Thank you, Bernard, for this very uh, constructive and very specific recommendation. I have to bring the panel to its end, and I really appreciate the active participation of everybody. I think we've traveled um, quite a lot of territory, starting from agreeing that there are significant unmet needs and um, that we need to design the R&D system for the 21st century. I won't venture to summarize, but uh, hi uh, highlight only a few points that you all made. Uh, the first is that there's been tremendous changes over the last decade in the R&D environment that have brought together the public and private sector. But however, that uh, there's consensus here that uh, public health systems are under pressure and that innovation will come from countless partners, but it has to be driven to priorities and that the WHO should set those priorities and have strong mechanisms to do so. It has already initiated discussions for priority setting. It has also initiated discussion for fair pricing, but it's being asked to do much more, maybe short of doing the research itself, but instead uh, to uh, effectively coordinate. The uh, antibiotic resistance is clearly a catalyst, an opportunity for driving uh, an acceleration to this agenda, which can be kind of clothed into health security close, but it is fundamentally a, a, a strategic development goals uh, agenda as well. And um, we're looking at uh, WHO being at, at the center, not necessarily, as I said, an, as an operator of R&D, but as a strong uh, driver for this agenda. We discussed the, um, the fact that that is actually not set, that the WHO role in the future is still in brackets. So there's clearly lots of opportunities for influencing and we expect that we will all be out of this room back into the Palais and um, playing your respective roles into uh, driving the convergence of our uh, collective agenda for strengthening an R&D um, uh, framework for the future. Thank you very much and um, thank you for joining the GCSP.